Okay, good evening. So tonight's question is about protecting one's practice as a lay person. Um, the person asking expresses their distress at um, seeing how easy it is to fall away from the practice, even for those who have done practice before but find themselves back in worldly life and find it very hard to keep up their practice. So I thought about this and it, there were, well, three things I can say about this. That's what I came up with. The first thing I would say is that in some respects, and this is probably a little bit of a disappointment, but in some respects this question is outside of the sort of question I'm comfortable answering. But I think there's a at least a small lesson there, and that's in regards to our practice and our perspective as Buddhist practitioners. I teach meditation. I think it helps my practice. It fulfills my sort of duty, I can say, to other beings. It feels comfortable, something I can do for others, and it's not a great uh, distraction from my own spiritual development. Uh, but that's the same for anyone, and that's for people who are interested in practicing. Um, to Trying to... to help people who are not interested in practicing, find ways to be interested in practicing, has always felt a little bit outside of the realm of what is uh, useful and beneficial. So we're starting to enter into that realm, I think, with this question. People ask me often, I often get adults wanting me to teach their children how to meditate, and I've always found that profoundly wrong or fundamentally unpleasant, um, like, um, not unpleasant, the word is improper, or feeling, giving giving a, an awkward sort of feeling, like, like not quite right, for this reason. You know, because you're talking about people who don't want to meditate, but want to want to meditate, and, and here it's their parents want them to want to meditate. So, if you take a person... Uh, who is not interested in meditation, but really would like to be interested in meditation. That's the sort of problem that comes up. You know, lay Buddhists who uh, like the idea of meditating, but find themselves distracted by so many things. So there's certainly no sense of criticizing or, or blaming anyone who... who who gets distracted by worldly life, but there should be, I think, no expectation for anyone but themselves to, to find a way to uh, overcome that, to some extent. Uh, I, I think we have to understand that the Buddha wasn't even a savior. The Buddha did teach lay people, and he taught some things that were quite useful for lay people, and, and very much outside of the purview of or the realm, or the the, the the limit, or the range of, of meditation practice. Um, but even the Buddha had very little to say be, beyond um, describing right ways to live your life. There's no limit to our potential to help other beings. If, if we want to go further, we could help beings in hell, we could help animals, figure out how to get dogs to be interested in good things that would eventually perhaps allow them to be born as humans. Meaning we, there's no limit to the amount of help we could give to other beings, but 
that's not certainly my goal. I don't think it's a goal that the Buddha advised in his followers. And so I think it's a, a good lesson for us to remind ourselves our certain perspective and a balance. And the balance always has to be weighted in favor of our own spiritual development. We can't really help others if our attention is always on helping others. Because, of course, helping anyone, yourself or another person, depends upon your own spiritual development. And one's own spiritual development has to require a preponderance of attention to one's own practice. First thing I'll say. But, um, well, one other thing that's also a little bit discouraging, I think, is that fundamentally we're asking, the, the question is asking, or in a, in a part, part of it asking for something that is uh, impossible or contradictory. It's like uh, the, the, ha the expression of having your cake and eating it too. It's like saying, how can I be a really good meditator and live in the world? Well, honestly, y you can't. And a part of one of the most important, one important support of meditation practice is leaving the world physically. Of course, mentally much more important. And, and technically, is it possible for someone to live a spiritual life in the world? Technically, it's possible. But to find a way to, for, for an ordinary average person like you or me to, to do that, uh, and then be dis, dis, distressed by how difficult it is and wonder how you can make it easier. It's really not the case. How you can make it easier is be a lot stronger, a lot more perfect and a lot more pure, which I'm not expecting anyone to be. I don't, I, I don't consider myself to be like that. It's always by people who practice Buddhism and by the Buddha himself been described been been said that lay life is a dusty road. It's it's all confined and restricted and and mixed up. It's uh, it's not the like in the olden days, in the time of the Buddha, when when there was a lot of traffic, there would be a great amount of dust. Uh, you'd have horses and just people walking and, and it would be a crowded roads would be very dusty and dry and not very pleasant because people would be defecating on the side of the road and that sort of thing garbage on the side of the road and they say in in in, all, in comparison leaving home and going to live in in seclusion a simple life is is the open air it feels much more fresh much more pure and free and so to ask about how to make meditation in lay life easier is problematic at its core because I think you're much much better served understanding how difficult it is and it's, it's for some people it's not possible for them to leave it behind and so, so important for them will be to understand that it's not going to be easy and I think part of our practice is always about understanding and coming to terms with difficulty and I think to some extent all ever trying to make your practice easier is uh, is problematic so instead of looking at it as something wow this is really difficult and I'm struggling uh, try and reframe it and learn to be mindful of the struggle and mindful of what it is that is causing the struggle and so on. Which brings me to the third thing, which is more hopeful, um, but a little bit critical as well. I don't mean to be entirely critical, but it's critical in general of us as Buddhists, uh, as meditators. We often focus solely on meditation practice. And so you come here to practice and you can be forgiven because that's all we teach you and, and that's really what we give you. So you come here, you learn how to meditate and you say, okay, I've done meditation. Then you go home and you try to continue to meditate like that uh, and it doesn't work or it's problematic. And 
This is because even here, meditation requires support. Uh, much of your support is given to you artificially, right? Um, your livelihood is pure here. and You don't have to even go to work for it. You don't have to demean yourself doing something meaningless in order to get food and, and shelter and so on. Um, but your environment is pure. There's no distractions. There's no... Um, there's nothing pulling you here or there. Desire, there's no conflict with other people. There's no manipulation or anything like that. And so it, it feels like, wow, this is okay, all I have to do is meditate. But you go home and none of those supports are there. Um, and of course, even here, um, there, there is, there, there is, there can be the lack of support. Many people come to practice and aren't able to continue or finish the course because they lack the support. So um, it's been good in general for us to do this this correspondence course, the online course, because it, uh, first of all, provides a filter. If you're really not ready to do a course here, uh, here you'll figure it out in the online course. If you're not able to do that, uh, then you won't make it. Yeah, we we means it it um, selects the people who are really keen to do it, but it also prepares you. It's a great way to uh, understand the dynamics of the practice and and what is necessary to use as a support. How to how to begin to organize your life in a way that is supportive of meditation practice. But deeper than that, there are. Uh, there are qualities of individuals that are required And we, there's something we call Upanisaya Upanisaya is what you come into this world with um, Well, that's, what, that's how it's talked about in Thai I think in Pali the word is Visaya Visaya means or Upanisaya maybe as well Anyway, there's this idea of what you bring into this life Meaning some people are just never going to be uh, into practice or, or capable of practicing Capable of being interested in practicing uh, And for most of us We're kind of halfway We have some interest and capability of practicing But it's rough and it's difficult That's because we haven't brought A great support into this life And it can also be because we're not developing Or our, our development of support is often um, Incomplete or partial And so these are things like uh, Being a good person Being kind, being generous Having a pure heart, right? Because what we mean by being a good person Is really that, having a pure mind and a pure heart And the purer your your foundation as an individual is Of course the easier it is to have pure thoughts Clear thoughts um, Steady and, and uh, coherent thoughts um, and so this applies to lay people It's a big reason I think why you can um, I can agree that Much of the teaching that is given to lay people Lay Buddhists Is proper You know we We, we often hear criticism of monks Who teach lay people only very shallow dhamma And they should be teaching deeper dhamma And it's true to some extent But it's also forgivable Because really uh, things like being generous and keeping morality and practicing basic meditation like loving kindness and so on may not get you to nibbana, but it certainly creates a great foundation. It it, it is uh, wrong to stop there and and you know never hint at something more. You should always be um, leaving the door open for people who are ready to make the jump because there are always, of course, lay, many lay people. You don't have to be a monk to want to practice meditation But the foundation is equally important And it's not just a foundation, it's a support I always make this um, this analogy of a tree If you want to grow a tree from a sapling You can't just plant it and leave it You need support <clears throat> Through the winters, especially here in Canada We know this because even just the snow and the cold You have to protect it from them And to use other sticks to prop it up and so on. 
Uh, and so even when you're practicing meditation, especially not here where you have everything sort of laid out for you, you need to set up your life in ways that are wholesome. Conduct good works, good deeds, do good things for the world around you. Even in, in terms of teaching, helping other people come to the practice can be a very good way to support your own practice. Because it creates, it gives you this environment. It surrounds you with people who are interested in meditation. It challenges you and tests you. Keeps you straight. Another one, another important one is something like um, your your association with other people. Not something like it. That in and of itself is one of the most important qualities. Um, Right, so having teaching other people is a part of that, but just associating with other practitioners, having a, a meditation group that you go to sit with or whatever, being surrounded by other people is very important for people who are in a good place. Um, where you live, what you do, your work, there's, there's so much, and it starts to get, as I said, outside of the purview of what I, the realm of what I consider my duty as a, as a meditation teacher, but there's just the general understanding that there's more to the practice than the practice you need. That's why I teach the Sabhasava Sutta quite often, because it reminds us of all the different things we need to, different aspects of our life that we need to consider as a protection for our practice. And um, the last part of that is something that I think could really help is our closeness with Buddhism, which to some extent is artificial, right? Our our connection with concepts, like the concept of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, even just the statues, having some kind of image in our mind, the visualization of a Buddha image, um, the association with monks and chanting and rituals, candles, flowers, incense, um, these kind of things and uh, the sort of determinations that we make, may I always be close to the Buddha Sasana, they can often be artificial, uh, but they can also be quite helpful. Meaning, a person could be a very good person, have, have very good qualities of mind, and to some extent, I'm going to hedge it here because it's not entirely true, but to some extent, even though they have great good qualities, if they've never had any connection with Buddhism like as a concept, as a construct, as an institution, they may just never meet up with another Buddhist. They may not have the karmic connection or the, 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 the direction to ever find a way to go further because goodness in and of itself doesn't necessarily on a conventional level lead to enlightenment. It could just lead you to happy rebirth, heaven and so on. There are many non-Buddhists who are good people, Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus and all religions really have these people and because these religions have a part of them that teaches goodness. Some people take them up on that and cultivate it really quite well. But they never make it to Buddhism often because of um, their their connection, like the images of you know the the crucifix or or any other religious symbol, artificially, um, you know it sends them in that direction and it, it inclines them to meet up with those people, the Dhamma wheel. If you have these sort of symbols, so what I'm trying what 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 this all means and how this carries out in practice, is that things like getting involved with Buddhist culture can be very useful. Culture, Buddhist culture can be a very useful thing as a shell, as a means of supporting what is really and truly Buddhism. And a part of this is, as I said, the determinations. And I think a part of this is where we make a determination. For example, people make determinations to be reborn in the time of Metea, the next Buddha. That's a good determination to make. I don't think it's any in any way a uh, replacement for actual practice. It should never be. But as a part of our practice, to remember and to think and to... Even people will send prayers to Metea and 
not prayers, but in the sense of chanting and making a determination, paying respect to Maitreya, paying respect to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha in, in, in the form of chanting can be very helpful to set your mind in a way that's close to the Buddha's teaching. Uh, and, and it's not just for future, it's for your own present life. This isn't just so that one day I might be reborn in, with Maitreya. It keeps you close to the Buddha Sasana. It keeps you in touch with other Buddhists, even if they aren't practicing. Maybe they've studied Buddhism and can remind you of certain things. We often learn a lot as meditators from scholars because they they have a lot of knowledge and they're able to explain things in a very... Sometimes, not always, but often in a very uh, clear and logical manner. Um, but the other side of that, and it's the last thing I'll say, is that to some extent it's just our purity of mind. And to some extent goodness is enough. Really, Buddhism ultimately isn't an artificial religious thing, institution. It's just about seeing reality. And so in regards to life practice being difficult in lay life and, and the struggle, uh, to many... In in many respects, this is just our um, our failing as uh, Buddhist practitioners, and it's what we have to recognize that we are incomplete. Um, often we make goals. Our, we we fixate on the goal, and and okay, I'm going to practice, and it's going to work, and I'm going to become enlightened. When in fact it may take you lifetimes to become fully enlightened. And it certainly may take much more than just sitting down and practicing meditation. Not to trivialize the, the, the core importance of meditation, of course, it's by far the most important thing. But rather to say that our meditation might be difficult and problematic. So take the example of a person who stops meditating wants to get back into meditation but finds themselves distracted by so many things. Their perspective, I think, it's important that it changes. That they, rather than think of it, oh, I'm not meditating and therefore I'm failing, or so on, or this person has stopped meditating and therefore they're failing. We should look rather at our situation and how we can get closer to freedom from suffering. And that's not always through meditation. Um, but it, I think it always is through things like mindfulness, you know, walking down the street mindfully, having a different perspective instead of saying I'm a failure so I just might as well give up, to say no, I, when I was walking down the street I was mindful, or right now I'm walking down the street and I can be mindful. We don't need Buddhist uh, rituals and they certainly don't save us from our lack of meditation practice. Um, but mindfulness is much more important, of course. Um, than rituals, and actually in some ways more important than what we call practice. A person could do hours and hours of meditation practice and never get anywhere if they're not actually being mindful. Uh, in, in my, my teacher said this, and he's in opposition, there's a story of one monk who, who became enlightened with three steps, I think it was. So walking down the street, if you say walking, walking, you can become enlightened just there if the conditions are right. So I don't, to some extent, that isn't a entirely um, satisfying answer, I don't think. But uh, I, I think for the reasons and for, based on the explanation, we have to understand uh, clearly this uh, concept of worldly life and enlightenment and, and all the um, all the points in between. And how they, how we can connect the not dots from one to the other. So, ultimately, what I do is teach, try to teach meditation practice to those who are interested, and um, I think at the very least helping people understand how to be mindful, which of course is applicable anywhere, Practi practicable, practicable anywhere. Is practicable even a word? Anyway, that's the answer to that question. Thank you for...
asking. Thank you for listening.